morning. It's great to be here, and uh, great to be here uh, for Constitution Day, uh, which is somewhat neglected uh, among our holidays. You know, we don't have fireworks or razzmatazz kind of stuff, cookouts. Uh, Constitution is sort of a sober document that seems to uh, not to give rise to these kind of uh, enthusiasms. But uh, we ought to be more enthusiastic about it than we are. I would argue that we are, it is a, a, a badge of our, our, of, uh, the, of our national pride that is, uh, is unique. That other countries have birthdays, other countries have independence days, but we're the only one that has a 229 year old constitution that is a, the longest living written constitution in the history of the world and continuous use. So, um, here, here for the Constitution. You know, set off a firecracker in your spare time. Uh, tomorrow is actually officially Constitution Day, September 17th. Um, and some more immediate reason to think about the Constitution today is the, to think of how uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which are really part of the Constitution, uh, um, begin the First Amendment. Um, in the beginning of the First Amendment is Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, religious protection for religious liberty, religious freedom, uh, is the first right. And that's not a coincidence. Uh, that it, is, it does reflect the uh, value that the framers of the Constitution placed on it. Um, the status of religious liberty as such um, is very much in play. It, it always is. And that's, I think, one ought to be one consolation to those of us who are worried about it at, at the present time. That it, it isn't the first time. It won't be the last time that uh, we hope <laughs> that religious liberty will be a contested uh, entity. Um, <clears throat> I would say that religious liberty may well be the principal issue of the 21st century, um, not just here, but around the world. In the international arena, many of the bloodiest and most intractable conflicts involve believers of various stripes and the nations, communities, uh, tribes, enclaves in which they're, uh, uh, of which they're a part, in which their respective faiths reside. <coughs> These, <coughs> excuse me, conflicts are taking a particularly heavy toll on vulnerable religions and ethnic minorities. In Europe, the ability of Orthodox Jews to practice their time-honored right of male circumcision has come up against intense legal and political pressure in ways that suggest that the strictures are the entering wedge of a new wave of, uh, of an old European problem, uh, anti-Jewish sentiment the return of the repressed. Um, in Iraq, Syria, Egypt, other places in the Middle East, long established Christian communities that have existed for thousands or more years are suddenly faced with the prospect of extinction at the hands of Islamist militants. In India, an enduring and often violent uh, uh, enmity between Hindus and Muslims uh, and the Muslims' uh, vulnerable minority status has been made more volatile by the rise of political Hindu nationalism. In countries such as Turkey and Saudi Arabia, the very idea of any shred of official recognition for religious liberty and religious pluralism is inconceivable. Meanwhile, in the West, the preaching of traditional Christian moral teachings about human sexuality has been labeled a human rights violation and proscribed in some places by courts. One could go on at considerable length and cite other examples, but the pattern is clear. The kind of respectful tolerance needed to underwrite the free and robust expression of religious belief is coming, becoming a rarer thing in the world. In some places, the cause is militant religion. In other places, the cause is aggressive irreligion or anti-religion caught between the post-religious secularism of Europe 
and the virulent sectarianism of much of the rest of the world, the generous ideal of religious freedom with its emphasis on the integrity of the individual human conscience is vulnerable and in some places abandoned. <clears throat> Surely though for most of human history, um, this has been the case. Uh, so it's all the more reason why the achievement of religious liberty such as we have in the United States has always been a cause for celebration and gratitude. That's sort of one of the things in my chapel talk. Uh, religious freedom is an exceedingly fragile and difficult idea in both theory and practice because it holds in tension two conflicting ideals. The right to order one's life according to the truth as one understands it on the one hand and on the other hand, the obligation to tolerate those who understand things differently and order their lives differently. That's a, a, a serious tension there. Uh, it's sometimes thought that religious, religious liberty can only flourish where the truth claims of religion are weak and secondary. That people don't care that much, therefore whatever. Um, but in America, this hasn't really been the pattern. Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French observer, uh, noted in the early 19th century that religious belief in America was flourishing in remarkably diverse and inventive forms uh, precisely because it didn't have to rely on the coercions of a religious establishment to protect it. Remember the First Amendment, Congress shall um, make no law respecting an establishment of religion. There was never to be an official American church, but the, uh, the free exercise of religion was to be protected. Um, so uh, religion would flourish by not being officially imposed. Um, the American record regarding religious li liberty has never been perfect. There are many exceptions to the rule. Uh, the painful experiences of Quakers, Catholics, Mormons, Jews, and other religious minorities can attest to that. But the story on the whole has been a positive and inspiring one, one that's unfolded over time as a story of steady expansion and improvement, and certainly something in which, uh, an area in which the United States can uh, point with pride by its comparative advantages with respect to the rest of the world. It's been a complex uh, dialectical process um, not unfolding neatly. Uh, a reading of John Winthrop's 1630 sermon, The Model of Christian Charity, which many of you have, may have seen, laid down the, the social, political, and, and religious foundation for Puritan New England, showed how profoundly a deeply Christian and intensely communitarian ethic informed the origins of American life. Um, and although Winthrop's brand of religion did not prevail, did not dominate, uh, it remains the case that for most of the country's history there was an informal establishment of religion, a very much informal establishment, a form of generic Protestant Christianity which shaped the characteristics of American religious liberty. This informal establishment has lost much of its hold over the past century. I, I want to give you a little background here so that the current crises uh, can be seen in a longer view. Beginning in the 1940s, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, jur excuse me, jurisprudence um, began making greater use of the Establishment Clause, part of that, the First Amendment that I read to you. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And um, of course, the original purpose of that was to prevent there being a kind of American version of the Church of England. But recently, and beginning in the 40s, the court construed it to place ever more demanding limits on the role of religion at all in public life in ways that seemed to contradict the second part of this First Amendment's uh, religious clause, that, that is, to the, the free exercise thereof. Congress shall make no law restricting the free exercise of religion. Um, let me. Uh, in, in my view, and in, I think in the view of the, some of the most intelligent observers of the, the phenomenon that uh, this has led us into a, uh, an unnecessary conflict that American democratic institutions actually depend 
on the presence of religion. They defend as much on the free expression of our religious traditions because those are the source of values that uh, propel uh, our, our civic life together. Um, it depends on that as much as it does on the constraint of religion's ability to exercise direct political power or operate as an establishment. That both influences, both forces are needed. A healthy balance between them needs to be achieved. Theocracy of any kind violates the principle of religious liberty. But so does uh, the, the, the concept of the naked public square, that is, a version of public life in which all meaningful public religious expression has been completely forbidden. Such a state of affairs would traduce the cause of pluralism by erecting a counter-establishment of secularism to which, which every knee must bow, every tongue confess, and in the face of which every faith must withdraw into the realm of private life. This is clearly the wrong way to go. The, the better way is the achievement of a civil public square which would strike the right balance between a healthy, inclusive national ethos and values forming, healthy values forming mediating institutions such as churches, denominations, religious liberty. So our choices in my view, and here I'm really borrowing from a man named Richard John Newhouse, uh, who wrote very eloquently about these matters and invented the term the naked public square. Um, Newhouse believed our choices shouldn't be restricted either to the privatization of religion on the one hand or the complete integration of church and state on the other. Uh, the separation of church and state is a sound principle, uh, but it shouldn't be viewed as the only principle and an absolute principle, that there should be a, a room for the intersection, uh, overlapping commerce between the two. This view seemed triumphant during the 80s and 90s, uh, years that were much more favorable to the public expression of religion not all that long ago. So things can change quickly for the worse. Um, we ought to keep in mind they can change for the better too. So, <laughs> I, there was a, I want to leave you with some optimism. Um, the world historical importance of the pontificate of John Paul II uh, in the overcoming of Soviet communism had something to do with that development. Um, the Clinton administration, along with near unanimity from the Democrats and Republicans in Congress, supported something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1993. It was a corrective to a somewhat unfortunate Supreme Court decision, um, which had been perceived as an overstepping uh, move. I won't go into the details of that. Um, President Clinton, uh, in, in, uh, in, in his welfare reform measures in the 90s, include, included the idea of charitable choice, which meant that the government funds for uh, the provision of social welfare program, say for example a, uh, an alcoholism treatment center, could be provided to Christian or religious or non-religious agencies with e equality. In other words, it would not be a prejudice against Christian alcoholism treatment centers just because they were church associated. This was pushing back against some of the tendencies of the court since the 40s. Um, and this uh, lasted into the George W. Bush administration. It was expanded in many ways. Uh, it appeared when Obama ran for president in 2008 that he, would, he was very deferential toward people of faith. <clears throat> Reached out to evangelical groups like Sojourners and Call to Renewal. But uh, that expectation was not borne out, shall we say, in Obama's presidency. He's brought the era of balance to an end and initiated a push towards official secularism that's striking and nearly unprecedented in its scope and force. Um, let me give a few examples, and I won't bring this all the way up to date, uh, but um, one early indication of where things were going was the president's subtle but unmistakable shift towards describing the commitment to re religious liberty as freedom of worship which is a more restrictive right than freedom of religion. 
it serves to re define religion as a private activity rather than an all-embracing way of life for its adherence with both private and public ramifications. Uh, the legal strategy behind this seemingly innocuous shift of language became evident in 2012 in the so-called Hosanna Tabor case uh, in which government lawyers had sought to deny the, um, the uh, applicability of an exception for ministers to uh, the staffing of a church-run school. Um, the uh, uh, Supreme Court emphatically did, did the right thing, uh, saw this as an infringement on religious liberty, and nine to zero voted, voted down the government's effort to, to, uh, to, to uh, establish this um, very, very tight restriction of what the ministerial exception uh, would apply to. Um, that was a resounding victory for religious liberty. Um, Less clear-cut have been the series of simmering cases involving uh, the, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, the health care law, and particularly the Department of Health and Human Services mandate, which was not itself part of the legislation, but was an administrative prerogative that the law made allowance for. Uh, the, the, I'll call it the HHS mandate for short, the Health and Human Services, would require all employers, including church-run schools, hospitals, and charities to provide their employees with health insurance plans covering contraception, abortifacients, sterilization, and uh, other procedures that would, uh, particularly for Roman Catholics, uh, necessitate the violation of core moral teachings, and not only Roman Catholics. As we saw, the principal case so far that has uh, arisen to challenge the HHS mandate successfully was brought by uh, the Green family, who run Hobby Lobby. Uh, we call it, I'll call it the Hobby Lobby decision, um, which the court rendered in 2014, um, uh, in which a family-owned corporation was accorded the right to decline to provide uh, the kind of coverage that the HHS mandate uh, mandated, um, but it was a razor thin, it was a 5 4 decision uh, by the court. And so, uh, not as resounding as Hosanna Tabor, and, not, and alarming to people. Uh, I mean, the people are grateful for the victory, but a, a very, the thinnest of possible margins. Um, the, the polarization over the HHS mandate has been interesting. Uh, it brought together the Roman Catholic Church uh, and the president of Wheaton, Wheaton College in Illinois, which is the leading evangelical school, actually a place that's known for the fact that it, when its faculty members convert to Catholicism, as occasionally happens, they have to leave. <laughs> they, uh, they won't allow uh, Catholics on their faculty. They're very, very strict about their views. And uh, um, yet they uh, embraced one another in opposing the HHS mandate, the Orthodox priest uh, seeks uh, you know, all sorts of religious believers of different faith communities, non-Christian, um, came together to oppose this mandate. Um, not to support Catholic doctrine, which many of them disagreed with uh, on reproduction and contraception and so on, but to the defense of, of general defense of religious freedom, which they saw as being endangered. Um, on the other hand, secular supporters of the administration seemed to, to, to be annoyed and mystified by this opposition. And one guy in particular, I think, had an illuminating response. A guy named Ed Kilgore, not a, just a journalist, not a particularly notable person, but he read, writing in the Washington Monthly said, how did religious freedom ever come to mean the right to have one's particular religious views explicitly reflected in public policy? What gives Catholic bishops the right to contend they should be able to operate a wide range of quasi-public services and enjoy the use of public subsidies without complying with laws and regulations that contradict their religious and moral teachings. Were they not seeking a kind of unwritten concordat of a broad zone of immunity from laws they choose to regard as offensive? Um, I think uh, these are important questions. Um, you may not like the tone in which they're being asked, but I think they deserve a response. And, in general, uh, religious believers need to prepare themselves to hear these kinds of questions 
again and again in the years to come and to contemplate how they'll answer them. Uh, I want to offer five uh, ways, general ways, of answering uh, these questions uh, to you. Um, a little handy, handy guide <laughs> to, to answering, in a way, the question of why, why religion is special. And I'm talking about religion generally here, not just the Christian faith, uh, but why uh, it is the case that uh, religion deserves a certain kind of special treatment, uh, special attention, even deferential attention. So I have five arguments. They don't exhaust all the possibilities, but they may begin to suggest some of the reasons why discussions about religious freedom that we're having in the years ahead need to be placed in a larger and richer context than is uh, often the case. And, uh, and, and the language of abstract neutrality is able to allow. Okay, for, first of these five is what I call, and I give each one a, a, a name, uh, the, I call it the foundational argument. Foundational argument points back to our historical roots in the Western Judeo-Christian tradition and more specifically to the spirit and uh, ideas animating the American founders and the constitutional order that they devised and instituted and under which we still live for the most part. The founders, as you know, uh, had diverse views about a variety of matters, including their own personal religious convictions. Some of them, notably Thomas Jefferson, but not only him, uh, had rather unorthodox views. Um, uh, I think a great deal too much is made of that fact. Um, uh, but what they were in, in agreement about is one thing, and I'll come back to Jefferson a little later. That was just a little in passing comment. But the one thing they were in agreement about is the general importance of religion. The active, the importance that whatever regime what they devised, it had to be one that actively encouraged religious belief and practice for the success of the American experiment. There are so many examples of this uh, in their uh, letters, in their public documents. I could keep you here the rest of the day quoting from them, but let me give you a few of the most famous and best. John Adams, second president of the United States, uh, uh, father of the sixth, sixth president? It was John Quincy Adams, <laughs> um, and uh, one of the patriots of the American Revolution, uh, a figure of great stature, although he was a little guy. <laughs> uh, John Adams said, man is constitutionally, essentially, and unchangeably a religious animal. Neither philosophers or politicians can ever govern him any other way. Okay, well, uh, you don't like John Adams? How about George Washington. Everybody likes George Washington. Uh, universally respected in his time. Uh, it's it said that the office of the presidency in the Constitution was written with George Washington in mind, which is not a bad way to go about it. Um, but Washington was a very eloquent exponent of the view that religion was essential to the maintenance of public morality, without which a Republican form of government, and I mean small r Republican, um, a, 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 a form of government in which the people rule themselves uh, rather than being ruled in which they are citizens and not subjects. Um, without uh, the support of morality from religion, uh, a Republican government couldn't survive. Um, Washington said this in his great farewell address of 1796 as he was leaving the office of the presidency. Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, there, there, this, he, this stands in for countless others. Benjamin Rush, John Jay, a, a, a whole crowd of witnesses uh, uh, in this regard. And, um, and this also extended not just to religion for individuals, 
getting to a very important point of my talk, but to religious institutions. Uh, Washington said in 1789 about the Constitution, if I could have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution framed in the convention where I had the honor to preside might possibly endanger the religious, rights, right, excuse me, the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, i.e. church, certainly I would never have placed my signature on it. So it's not just the defense of the religious liberties of individuals who, you know, I mean, you can be perfectly free to believe that that God is a sow, God, God is the moon is, uh, God is made of green cheese along with the moon, uh, whatever, as an individual. Um, but uh, this would also protect the right of ecclesiastical societies uh, to be formed around shared beliefs. This becomes, I think, extremely important as we try to understand what religious liberty is. Okay, so that's reason, the foundational reason, number one. And you may well say, uh, well, okay, that was then and this is now. Why should we feel bound by the, uh, the mentality of a bunch of 18th century guys? Um, none of the founders could have envisioned the cultural and religious diversity of 21st century America. Their views, so goes this argument, uh, assumed a degree of cultural uniformity that's beyond our power to restore even if we wanted to. I think these objections have a lot of validity to them. But the very fact of our diversity leads to a second argument for deference to religion, and I call this the pluralistic argument. This would seek to protect religion all the more as a source of moral and social cohesion. Let me explain. Those of you who are students of American history <clears throat> may know that the history of American religion is often parallel to the history of American immigration. They often end up being the same history. From the mid-19th century on, every new wave of immigration, and, and actually you could begin much earlier than that, you could begin with John Winthrop and the Puritans and the Pilgrims, but every new wave of immigration brought peoples for whom a set of distinctive religious beliefs and practices were the core of their identity. Uh, uh, you think of the, the influx of uh, Italians and Poles and Greeks and, and so on, and the massive immigration uh, beginning in the, in the post-Civil War era. Um, some of the worst examples of religious prejudice in our nation's history come out of the clashes of these years, but so too did the idea of pluralism, that pluralism was a central feature of American life. I quote again Richard John Newhouse, um, this nation is constituted as an exercise in pluralism, as the unum within which myriad plures are sustained. Now he's referring to e pluribus unum, you know, out of many, one, uh, one of our national mottos. And so he's, uh, even if your Latin is as bad as mine, you can sort of get it, that the unum within myriad, within myriad plures are sustained. In other words, the American national ethos has a powerful but limited scope. We don't try to produce a pure national moral community in which all forms of intermediate association and local affiliation uh, and sectarianism are abolished or neutralized. No, we don't try to do that. We do have places of national piety, like the Lincoln Memorial, the Arlington Cemetery, and so on, that embody the, the spirit of the nation. But we also allow for the persistence of re religious, regional, ethnic, and other differences, um, because those are the places in which moral community, thick moral community, when consciences are formed. Then consciences are not formed in the national community. Consciences are formed in churches, synagogues, mosques, families, and the like. Um, hence, in America, the national purpose, rightly understood, ought to uh, not to undermine particular affinities and purposes, but particularly we know they are healthy ones, uh, but to strengthen them. Um, the American civil religion for of us as a nation serves to support the strength and freedom of smaller moral communities that stand apart from it. 
So uh, it, it follows from this that religious liberty should be understood not just as an individual liberty, but as I use the term corporate, a corporate liberty, a liberty that applies to groups, the freedom of groups, and, and defends the integrity and self-governance of such groups, obviously within limits, uh, uh, limits of, of, of the law. Um, you know, the Jesse James gang has just not become a church so, with, with the protections for the freedom of religion. But uh, how could it be otherwise than that liberty has to be a liberty, corporate liberty, a liberty of groups? Religion is like language. Uh, a language is inherently a social thing. You don't have a language all by yourself. Not really. I mean, you might have a little little code or something like that. But the English language is not my personal property. Um, it's not your personal property. It's something that, the, the extent that we are suspended in the web of significance that is the English language, we are, um, in, we are part of a group. We are socially connected to one another. Religion is the same way. Um, it's, it's, if language is the activity of a group rather than isolated individuals, it's the same with religion. religion uh, religious liberty must protect the liberty of individuals, but also the liberty of churches and religious institutions to protect their freedom to define themselves, to define what they are, what they believe, what they're not, to control the meaning in terms of their membership, to exercise freely exercise their faith in the way they choose to raise their children, order their community life, um, and to seek to embody their religion's moral understandings in their lived experience, which I think is a good way of defining what we mean by free exercise of religion. As I said, I think it's important, <clears throat> obviously this is not an absolute, uh, none of our liberties, our First Amendment liberties are absolute. Uh, religious liberty is not a carte blanche, all-purpose, get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, and there are limits on it uh, that have to do with uh, the things, you know, you can't have infant sacrifice, for example. Uh, that there are limits to what we will tolerate. Um, but the, 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 those limits uh, are, are uh, not hard to discern. The essential place of uh, religion in the healthy life of the plures, to go back to Newhouse's quote, should ensure for it a high degree of respect and set the bar very high for any government action that would have the effect of burdening religion's free exercise. This is a, this high bar has generally been affirmed by the federal courts and the Congress so far. There's a third argument and we have the foundational argument and the pluralistic argument. Now, the third argument. This gets a little more murky, but I think it's a strong, uh, it's a very strong argument with secular people. And that's part of what I'm trying for this audience to give you some equipment in arguing about these things with secular people. The third argument I call the anthropological one. You may lose a lot of people just right there, but you know. Um, and I'm gonna lay a word on you that um, it may not be helpful either. Human beings are theotropic by their nature. Uh, they incline toward religion, towards the conception of God. As uh, a helianthus, a flower, inclines toward the sun. And they're driven to relate their understanding of the highest things to their lives as lived in community together, both metaphysically and morally. Whether this characteristic is because of inbuilt endowment, evolutionary adaptation, cultural conditioning, or some other source, the truth, <laughs> it would seem to be a good thing for the secular order, a secular order, to affirm our theotropic impulses rather than seek to stifle them. Uh, the vote of public confidence inspired by such affirmation would engender a sense of general loyalty to the polity and bind religious believers affectionately to the secular political project, more effectively than would a rigorous secularist public square that basically tells them to shut up. 
Indeed, the latter course would present the very real danger, uh, very real danger, of producing alienated subcultures of religious believers whose sectarian disaffection with the mainstream could become so profound as to represent a threat to the cohesion of the nation itself. Seculars who worry about religion having too great a role in public life would be well advised to give some ground on this issue and acknowledge this theotropic dimension in our makeup, even if they believe it's a weakness. So that's the anthropological argument. Um, this, by the way, I mean, this is an addendum. This has the added benefit of promoting the development of a healthy uh, civil religion, which is a, a, a somewhat dodgy term, but uh, something that promotes our need to relate our secular things to ultimate purposes. Um, uh, this is something that promotes cohesion in the polity while serving as a general embodiment of sorts of this general thing that we call religion. Um, okay, uh, uh, I could say more about that, but um, let me go on to the fourth argument. And the fourth argument I call the meliorist argument. That may not be the best name for it, you may have a better name, but what this argument is that religion deserves a special place in American life because of all the social good, demonstrably, that religious institutions have done and continue to do in the world. And because the doing of such good works is an essential part of the free exercise of religion. This argument follows in the footsteps of the founder's emphasis on the moral formation of citizens. And it also embraces the role of religious groups historically in abolishing slavery, promoting civil rights, running orphanages, care for the indigent, running hospitals, and so on. It's taken a weight of, uh, on a weight of its own, given the vast scale and scope of charitable, medical, and educational activities still undertaken by religious groups today. Let me use the Catholic Church as a powerful example of this. I'm not a Catholic, so I'm not special pleading for Catholicism here, but uh, the HHS mandate was so consequential to them, to Catholics, because the Catholic Church is so heavily involved in precisely these three areas, charitable, medical, educational activities. Listen to these numbers. It, the Catholic Church operates uh, nearly 7,500 primary and secondary schools, enrolling 2.5 million students, over 600 hospitals, comprising nearly 13% of American hospitals and 15% of hospital beds. 400 health centers, 1,500 specialized homes, such as uh, the hospice and so on, uh, making the Catholic Church the operator of the largest educational and healthcare systems in the country. In addition, Catholic Charities USA is the seventh largest charity in the nation, the second largest, anyone know? The Salvation Army, also a religious organization. Um, Looking at the matter of religion's life-improving qualities from another angle, uh, and, and this is not an argument I'm especially fond of, but it's, it's one that for secular people sometimes carries some weight. You can point to a growing body of social scientific evidence appearing in the work of writers as diverse as Byron Johnson, Arthur Brooks, Jonathan Haidt, and Robert Putnam, that religious belief correlates reliably, reliably with the fostering of generosity, law-abidingness, helpfulness to others, and physical health. Um, <clears throat> it would appear in this argument that religion is not, as Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens said, a poison, uh, but something more like an antidote. Uh, it seems counterproductive to downplay its many benefits. So the meliorist argument. And something I should add, uh, I pass very quickly over the role of religious believers in the um, abolition of slavery. Um, this is something that I think my fellow historians say, are beginning to finally uh, correct the record on this. But let me state for you, and so, so you will have heard it at least, that there would have been no anti-slavery movement in the 19th century America without 
uh, the, the leadership and participation of Christians and specifically uh, evangelical Christians, evangelical Protestant Christians. Uh, it was not a movement favored by the Catholic Church, which I think is much the shame of, of many Catholics today. Um, the same was not true of the Civil Rights Movement, but uh, later on, over 100 years later. But uh, uh, it was, it was, there was no secular movement to speak of, of any political visibility or force uh, dedicated to the abolition of slavery. This was a Christian movement of moral reform, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So there's the Meliost argument, one of, one of the great uh, uh, crusades, if I may call it that, of American history uh, was one that took place because of the moral suasion and influence of Christians. <clears throat> Last but not least, the fifth of my arguments is one I'll call the metaphysical. This, you may lose, if you haven't lost people by now, this, this one might really leave them in the dust. But it's often said that religious freedom is the first freedom because it's grounded in the dignity and integrity of the human person. And it requires that each of us be permitted our right and duty, both right and duty, to seek and embrace the truth about our existence and live out our lives in accordance with, that, accordance with that truth as we understand it. This was the central contention of one of the great documents of religious liberty in our history, James Madison's memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments. Um, interesting background to that. Uh, he was actually arguing with Patrick Henry, who was a great Christian patriot, um, against the idea that uh, taxes should be levied uh, in the, the, the citizens of Virginia in order to support uh, religious institutions. That's what religious assessments. Uh, in other words, uh, an establishment of religion, uh, which would not have been prohibited under the First Amendment because the First Amendment only applied to a national church. The states were allowed to have established churches, and in fact, uh, many of them did for a period of time. Anyway, here's what Madison said. It's wonderful words. It is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. Um, it's an it, it, interesting phrase worth unpacking. It's the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. Um, it's, uh, a, it expresses the notion that we have a duty, a pre-political duty, to, is before the, 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 the uh, creation of civil society in a sense, it, it, uh, to render to the creator uh, homage as we understand and, 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 and such only as we understand, um, as we believe is acceptable to the creator as we understand the creator. This is or should be a universal freedom because the great questions of human existence are not the exclusive province of professors and savants, uh, wise guys of various sorts, and are not the concern of the state, but they belong to us, to all of us, individually in whatever associations we choose to forge with one another. And actually, the. Uh, the centrality of freedom of conscience in American religious history is very strong. The notion that, that uh, we should not be coerced in our inmost conscience uh, to duties assigned, religious duties assigned to us by others, but it should be the, uh, the liberty of our conscience should be paramount. That's really, I think, expressed in Madison's language, the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. So uh, th this is, I, I say this is should be a universal freedom because the search for ultimate truth is something that belongs rightly to all of us. It is uh, something we pursue in various ways. We pursue it individually. We also pursue it in associations with others. Any good society 
that is committed to the flourishing of its members should recognize and encourage that search. It certainly has no business curtailing it. To acknowledge that fact in a public way with an explicit recognition of the valuable place of religion is an important declaration about the value that a society places on the spiritual and moral life of its members. I may, the metaphysical argument may uh, have, suffer from the name. We may, you may have a better one, but I think it's a very powerful one uh, and, and making a case for why religious liberty is, is the first of all liberties, the most fundamental, uh, even, even before the freedom of speech and freedom of expression. But there's more to the metaphysical argument than that, I think. There's a growing recognition that in the world we live in, a world dominated by large, immense, immensely large bureaucratic governments, sprawling transnational business corporations that often are indistinguishable from those governments or those governments from those corporations. Uh, behemoths that neither respond to the tools of de democratic governance nor are accountable to national laws or answerable to codes of behavior. Religion serves as an essential counterweight, a resource for upholding dignity, human dignity and moral order, for speaking truth to power, for giving support to the concept of human rights and dignity, and for insisting that a voice of moral urgency, celebrating, rebuking, exhorting, never become banished by the cold logic of instrumental rationality. Only the most hardened enemies of religion can fail to acknowledge this. It has played this role before in American history and has done so heroic, heroically. I've already mentioned the role of evangelicals in the, providing the animating force behind what's arguably the greatest reform movement in American history, the abolition of slavery. I've also mentioned the moral leadership of John Paul II in bringing about the end of Soviet tyranny in Eastern Europe. You could argue that the modern world, more than ever before, we're, we are uh, in danger of being devoured by the inflexible, inhuman logic of modernity's own creations, uh, and that we need to restore a dialogue with our tr religious traditions that we have abandoned and the wisdom thereof. Um, and that dialogue can't be uh, fruitful unless we sustain the high public standing that religion has hitherto enjoyed. Let me just conclude. I'm almost done. <laughs> There's an even deeper question here I just want to touch on. Um, and that's the question of whether freedom itself, more generally the liberal individualism, uh, and by liberal individualism I'm not necessarily meaning to attach it to liberalism as a political ideology, but just freedom that we've come to embrace in the modern West. Whether is that freedom sustainable without the Judeo-Christian religious assumptions that have accompanied and upheld it up to now? It's an interesting Italian writer, a guy named Marcello Pera, who argues, he's himself an atheist, but he argues that it's a dangerous illusion to believe that such ideas as the dignity of the human person can be sustained for long without some ultimate grounding in the deep normative orientation of the Christian faith. In this regard, he echoes some of the earlier comments of Tocqueville, who I've mentioned already. Uh, Tocqueville said he doubted whether man can ever support at the same time complete religious independence and entire public freedom. If faith be wanting in him, he must serve. And if he be free, he must believe. Tocqueville connected belief, uh, religious faith and freedom in that statement. Ironically, the very possibility of freedom operating within a secular realm of politics, which we embrace in the West, and which is in many respects a good thing. Um, not secularism, but a secular government. This may depend on the presence of certain specifically Christian distinctives 
embodied in culture as much as doctrine. I think this is an assertion that I've just made that thoughtful secularists ought to find at least plausible. Uh, indeed, Marcello Pera, the Italian atheist I just mentioned, was anticipated by one of the most, uh, one of the most religiously heterodox figures of early American history, a hero to atheists and agnostics, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a great favorite of the late Mr. Hitchens, uh, the guy who said uh, religion is poison. I, uh, if any of you ever had, had a chance to go to the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, you know that uh, some of the words of Jefferson are around the, uh, uh, the, on the panels around the walls. It's a round building. Um, very beautiful, very graceful, lovely monument. Um, in one of the panels uh, decorating the walls of the Jefferson Memorial has these words. God who made us, who, God who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we've removed a conviction that these liberties are a gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Let me read that to you again. I didn't read it so well at the beginning. <clears throat> God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his, God, and his justice cannot sleep forever. Now Jefferson was in that context, never trust a quote that's completely wrenched out of context, so I'll give you the context. Jefferson was speaking about slavery, the moral scourge of slavery, um, an institution that he both opposed and participated in. Um, and he was asking rhetorically whether there could be any moral justification for the failure to extend the blessings of liberty to all people. But there's a larger point. And it is clearly a point he is making. I'm not wrenching it out of context. It is there. Jefferson was asking whether the very possibility of human liberty itself, the liberty of each and every man and woman, was dependent on our prior willingness to understand liberty as a gift of God rather than a dispensation of man. Whatever one may assert about Jefferson's beliefs or non-beliefs, one can't escape the fact that the name of God serves as far more than window dressing, far more than a rhetorical device in this context. Even a world-class skeptic like Jefferson understood that erasing the name of God from the foundations of American political and public life could lead to fearful consequences. I tremble for my nation. I tremble for my nation which provides yet another reason why defending, defending the special status of religion in American life. It's not merely a reasonable and defensible path, but a task of the most <laughs> fundamental importance. Thank you all for being so patient through long talk. <laughs>